the question is, what phosphorylates FOXO3A? And I'm going to give credit to my postdoc in my lab who went on the right track because I went on the wrong track. I was trying to find uh, certain genes and proteins on a different way. And she found that there's one other protein known to do that. Uh, it's also known to increase the mTOR pathway. And it has never been studied in skeletal muscle before, just in kidney and brain. And it's called serum glucocorticoid kinase for the simple reason we call it SGK. Okay? So the question now was, is SGK going to be upregulated during hibernation? And lo and behold, that was the case. You can see that it's significantly upregulated as the total and also the phosphate forms, all of these forms are upregulated. And then actually the animals wake up and get out of hibernation. You see that it's going down again. So here you have more here, and then after hibernation, it goes significantly down. So it's a really hibernation-specific phenomenon. Okay. Now a little bit of background. There are two types of muscle fibers we all have. One are the type 1 muscle fibers, and these are the ones which the marathon runners have because they need a lot of endurance exercise. And type 2 muscle fibers uh, are the fibers which people like Arnold Schwarzenegger have most of, and these are with, they're, they're important for strength exercise. People like me are somewhere in the middle, don't have many, much of any, but enough of both to keep going. Um, so we wanted to look where SGK is expressed uh, during hibernation. You can see that there's significantly more SGK expressed in these fibers, and if you do double staining with the marker for type 2 fibers, you see that these are all the type 2, the strength exercise pathway muscle fibers where this SGK is expressed. So that was all very interesting and fascinating, but the question was, is this something which is a squirrel-specific thing, or is this actually something which you could generalize? So the way how you do this is you start to look for animal models, or you make animal models, where you have no SGK or where you have too much SGK. And I'm going to show you first uh, some results of mice that don't have any SGK. These were done, these were made by a collaborator in Germany who was interested in kidney and brain and has always been wondering why the muscle is not behaving the way how it should. And if you look at the muscle, it, it doesn't blow you away, even whether you whether you're a muscle biologist or no. But you see that there are several smaller tiny fibers, and it appears that some of them overall seem to be less homogeneous than the one on this side. And if you quantify this, you see that there's Indeed, uh, a little bit of smaller fibers in these SGK uh, muscle, mouse muscles, so the muscle gets shrinks and it becomes atrophic. And if you now see what the function of these mice is, and you put them on a treadmill for one month, uh, on, a, on a water rod for one month, and they keep running, you see that they are significantly less running than the wild type mice. What's really important here is remember the strength exercise stuff. They actually keep running in terms of endurance quite nicely. They just can't mount the energy and the strength to run as much distance as the wild type mice. But this is not an endurance problem which makes sense with the type 2 fiber expression. And if you look at uh, the overall strength, uh, and then you take the muscle out and then you measure how much they can contract, you see it's significantly less in the SGK knockout mice than it is in the regular wild type mice. So now you want to see when, if you overexpress SGK whether it has something good, whether it brings you some advantage. And that's what we looked at, and we have a collaborator in Spain who helped us with these uh, experiments. And he made transgenic mice, and they demonstrate about a 30 to 40 percent increase of the active form of SGK. So why am I telling you this? Because it's actually quite important. For laboratory people to make a mouse which has that amount of increase of expression, it's very little. I know 30 to 40 percent sounds like a lot, but usually you look like 3, 400 percent expression, which is, I don't want to say that it's physiologically not helpful, but it's always a bit bothersome if you overexpress something so significantly. So the point I want to make here, why am I telling you all this? These mice have no obvious phenotype, and they don't have any negative phenotype because too much SGK, you would be worried whether this has negative impact on your heart, on your brain, uh, or whether it, could, whether it would give you cancer. So if you look at the muscle of these mice, and you 
don't do anything, they pretty much look the same. I know you feel like they may be a little bit larger here than here, but if you actually quantify this, they look the same way. So there's no, there's not an Arnold Schwarzenegger mouse which we're producing, which is good. I don't want to have Arnold Schwarzenegger mice because you don't want to have Arnold Schwarzenegger running around with on Mars. <laughs> um, <coughs> so the question is, can you prevent any kind of challenges which would, which would lead to loss of muscle mass. And the easiest experiment we did is to just starve these mice. Uh, and if you take a wild type mouse and you starve them for 48 hours, you see how they develop small muscle fibers. And that's completely protected in these transgenic mice. If you quantify this, I'm just going to show this to you, you can see that this is the drop uh, uh, of starvation in uh, wild type mice, and here are SGK mice which don't show that drop. So we are now in the process of looking to other things, whether it's protected against immobilization, atrophy, and so on. And if we have that data, then we can read it. So it's being published. So in summary, what have we learned? The squirrels really helped us to identify a new protein, which is important for the regulation of muscle mass. Nobody's ever thought that this may play a role here. And I don't want to offend the AKT researchers. I have to make that smaller. I don't think it's more important than AKT, but I think it is similarly important. And we actually have some other evidence, which is a bit too complicated, to show that both of them really go together. The question is, is this the only thing which drives hibernation? So if I ask you the question, then the answer to this is obviously no. Um, so we looked into one other aspect of uh, muscle, which is quite important, and that's the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and it is the promoter of the endurance exercise, which is the one with the type 1 fibers. What we do know is that when, it's, when you have endurance ex exercise activity, or when it's cold, you get an increase in a protein called ADPK, and then you increase a protein called PGC1-alpha. That's the major regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis in the entire body. So what happens during hibernation? We see an increase in AMPK, like you see here. And like you would expect, you see an increase in PGC1-alpha during hibernation. And why am I telling you all this? Because you see more mitochondria in the hibernating muscle as compared to here. That really is as dark as it looks like here. And the interesting thing about this is the following. So far, People have assumed that you're either going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger or you're going to be a marathon runner, but you can't be both. Because there's what's called the AMPK AKT switch, meaning if you have too much of AMPK, then it turns down AKT. So this is a dominant pathway over the other. And what the squirrels are really showing us is something completely different. So that it doesn't exist in the squirrels. So I think what the way how you have to look at this is that hibernation the way how we look at this from a molecular point of view is really nothing else than <laughs> combining <laughs> endurance and strength exercise. And what's really fascinating about this is that's something we still have to figure out. Is obviously there's some player here that makes that happen. That we haven't identified yet, but I hope we will. And But I think it's an interesting idea just from, from a biological point of view. You don't eat, you don't drink, you don't upregulate the things which other people are working very hard for and they're not having any. So for the last five minutes, I'm going to switch to a different topic and I'll show you data from uh, my graduate student, who um, will be graduating soon, my first graduate student, uh, who did some very interesting work in aging muscle. And that is the, that is, this is the story which you can read next couple of important things about sarcopenia. I told you it's a progressive loss of muscle mass during age. And after the age of 50, 1 to 2% uh, of muscle mass is lost in anybody. Some people lose more. There's obviously a genetic uh, um, susceptibility. But everybody starts using muscle mass. And about 25% of people younger than 70 and 40% of people older than 80 are sarcopenic, meaning they have significant clinical, significant loss of muscle mass.